Hey everybody, my name is Derek Peterson with Adapt Media Agency. Super excited that you're here to watch this video and learn about the seven things that you can do today to make your website absolutely amazing. Let's go. So why is a great website important? We're gonna go over four things, four things and four reasons really why having a appropriately structured website is important. That first one is first impressions and really giving someone a great experience. If you think about it, quite often when we engage with a business uh, for the purposes of you know, satisfying the need that we have as a customer, that first experience is often done digitally. So whether it's a Google search, something we saw on social media, a link that we clicked, it brings you back to your potential website as a business and that establishes the first part of our relationship. You know, so if you think about first impressions with a human being, if you start off on the wrong foot, as they say, first impressions are everything. This is, uh, this is John, and John, this is my new flatmate, Darth. Oh, nice to meet you, Garth. Darth. Sorry? It's Darth. With a D. Darth. With a D. Yes. Right. So it's just like... Like what? Nothing. Never mind. And that experience thereafter may fall in line with how that first impression goes. So having an appropriately structured website that is done right is really the way in which we're gonna establish that digital trust. And ultimately, people buy from who they know, like, and trust. Those three, three things which I'll talk about repeatedly through this, uh, through this video are very, very important. So those first impressions are, we'll call it reason number one, why I think it's important that you have these seven things incorporated into your website. The second reason you want an appropriately structured website is because you want people to stick around. Let's face it, although people are impulsive and they make a pulse impulsive decisions, they need to be interacting with a website for an extended period of time. The longer I can keep somebody on my website, the longer I can keep them reading testimonials, reading information about the products or services that I have, the better chance I have of converting them because I'm educating them, I'm developing trust with them digitally, and ultimately, I'm getting them to convert. So the idea is to keep them around and get them from bouncing off your website. And we measure that through something called bounce rate, which we'll discuss later on in this video. The third thing is it needs to be designed to convert. So a lot of people forget when they develop a website, the number one reason why you develop a website, and that is to get someone to take what's called a call to action. Sometimes it'll be referred to as a CTA. Now a call to action can be different for different businesses. For some businesses, it may be to book an appointment. Let's say I'm an attorney and I just want you to book an appointment with me so that I can, maybe it's a free consultation so that I can sell you ultimately a retainer and you hire me as your attorney. If I'm a dentist, maybe it's ultimately, I want you to make a phone call. So that's the call to action, call now, call now. If I'm selling an e-commerce product, let's say I'm selling uh, t-shirts, right? So I'm selling t-shirts, my call to action is I want you to purchase and buy the product. So calls to action can be different for different businesses, but ultimately the entire website, the entire purpose is to inform, to engage, and then ultimately get that person to take the call to action. So we can't lose sight of that as we go through these seven steps. It's all designed to get people to do something. Number four, Google ranking. Let's face it, most people are going to find you on Google. And if we don't tell Google that we are a high quality, well thought out website, we're not gonna get served up high in the Google feed. So it's very, very important that we do things, which we'll discuss in these seven steps, that are gonna get you to rank higher in Google. That's critical. The reality is that as of 2021, Statistica.com reported that Google dominates online search with 92.47 of all searches that occur on the internet. So think about that. 92% of the searches that occur on the internet for people looking for a product or service happen via Google. So if you're not in that game and you're not playing that game well and you're not playing by Google's rules, you're not gonna get found. So it's gonna be super important that we take these seven steps into consideration and a lot of these actually have to do with Google. So with that said, let's jump into secret number one. Secret number one is you need to have a lot of high quality, well done images and videos on your website. Now this isn't just something that we made up. There's a lot of data 
and a lot of information that supports that images and really video are a crucial part to how people engage with the website. Let me share a couple of those statistics with you. And Voto's most recent data show that 93% of marketers use video this past year for sales, marketing, and communication. And lastly, when images are used for a relevant message, 65% of people will remember that message three days later versus if images and video were not used. So that makes a profound difference in terms of not only keeping someone engaged on your website, but actually getting them to remember it, right? So let's talk about maybe some of the other real bona fide reasons as to why you should have images and video on your website. First, it keeps people engaged. Let's face it, if you open up a website and it's got no images and it's got no video on it, it's kind of boring, right? And it's also a bit overwhelming because you just see these big blocks of text that aren't broken up. But we're gonna get into other things as to why images and video are important, but the real big reasons that just keeps people engaged. Let's use this example of a travel agency called Amy and Derek Travel, happens to be ours, where we use video on our website to be able to send a message or to, to engage people into going to a, on a particular cruise line to visit one of these islands. Let's show you a quick little clip of that. Now after watching that video, you can kind of put yourself in the position of those people that were there having a good time and you know, maybe there's a place that you want to go visit, right? You can start to see the emotion, you can see the sunshine, you can see the sand. You know, it's hard to tell that story. Um, it's hard to engage people in you know, how they could enjoy something like that without images and video. And travel is obviously a great example of this. Another reason why we use images and video is to help people grasp concepts. Sometimes when concepts are spelled out in words, which is very important to do as well alongside the video, um, the video really helps people uh, understand things a little bit better. People learn through different ways. Some people learn through listening, some people learn through watching, and some people learn through reading. So if we can have a lot of that incorporated by having video with audio and the words explaining a concept, that can really take your website and comprehension of what it is that you're doing to the next level. So uh, you know, here's an example of one of our chiropractor clients and a quick little video we shot with them to show the, uh, them how they interact with chiropractic care and just basically explaining it to their clients. Quick little clip right here on that concept of explaining something. I'm Dr. Andrew Herman, and uh, I just want to say thank you for your interest in, in chiropractic services. And what I want to do is just really help you understand exactly what we do at this office and then also at our Powersville office. By the time you've even gotten into this room, we would have already have taken x-rays, gone through your history, your exam, consult, and even done a couple therapies to get you warmed up and the body moving and the spine uh, acceptable to the adjustments. But there's two main ways that I focus on chiropractic. One is the correction of the spine. Uh, you know, the logic to me is always, if your spine looks like this, then we wanna fix it. Right? And one of the last reasons, and there are many more, why video is super important. It's to keep people on your page. And this just particularly has to do with Google. The more you can get somebody to stay on your page, the more Google says, hey, they must have good content. They must have good information. If your bounce rate, which is a rate by which people come to your website and leave, if that bounce rate isn't too fast, Google's gonna say, hey, these guys are good. And it's gonna shove you up the feed a little bit more. So it's super important to have good quality video that keeps the individuals engaged. We see this a lot with blogs and blog writers now. It's a big trend where well, they'll write a very long blog and then they'll put a video at the end of that blog, which is basically just the blog in video format. And some people who scan that blog looking for something may watch that video. Bottom line, keeps them on that blog page long enough for Google to you know, give you a couple thumbs up and push you up the feed a little bit. So that's basically what we wanted to cover as it relates to video and images, something you definitely need to take into consideration as secret number one. With that said, let's get into secret number two, and that is creating deep, relevant content. Back in the day, when we used to write for SEO, we used to stuff pages and stuff paragraphs with just keywords. 
that was the way you did it. But now Google knows and actually penalizes you if you just stuff content with a bunch of keywords. Um, so what used to work before in the past is now you're gonna get slapped on the wrist for. So you need to write content that is intended to educate and to inform and is well thought out, documented, and cited. So when writing that content, uh, like again, back in the past, we used to write for keywords. Now we write for engagement and we write for education and informing. And Google actually has the ability to tell if you're writing in stuffing with keywords or if you're actually writing something that people are sitting there and reading and is well thought out, which is kind of crazy to think that machine learning has gotten this smart, but it has. So we have to shift our writing away from being so keyword focused and focus more on deep relevant content. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how do we actually do that. So like I said, back in the day, we used to stuff with keywords. Now we don't do that, right? Because we're gonna get slapped on the wrist by Google. That was actually my hand. Slapped on the wrist by Google. So instead, we wanna use what's called related keywords. So if we have keywords that we're trying to rank for, there's actually a website that you can go out there to called LSI Graft. So you can see right here on the screen, I'll highlight it for you. And with LSI Graft, this is a website you can go in and you can type in your keywords. This is a free software and it will give you relatable keywords. So keywords that help you tell your story and help you deliver that deep and relevant content uh, intended to educate and inform and be able to be able to put keywords in there that are relatable versus the actual keyword. Google likes this. It's not so blatantly obvious that you're sitting there just jamming keywords into a paragraph that again, used to be the way we used to do it. Now we have to get a little creative and use softwares like lsigraph.com to be able to put in those relatable keywords. It's a tool that I strongly suggest you use when writing that deep relevant content. You know, that's probably our number one tip because in terms of writing deep relevant content, you know your content, you know your product and your services better than anybody else. You wanna make sure that you are writing thoroughly about it. And that really brings us to number three of our secrets on how to make an awesome website, and that's longer content. Top ranking websites have on average about a thousand words per page, which is a, now a modest amount. Google now with more, leaning more towards having deep relevant content are really looking for more uh, around the range of 1,500 to 2,000 words per page. When you think about that, that's a lot. So don't take my word for it. Let's actually look at some of the statistics that are out there right now from different companies that have done the research to see what Google prefers. So Yoast, word count for SEO, they place it at 1,000. So that's kind of on the low end. Search Engine Journal, a pretty prestigious company out there, uh, says that they want the ideal blog post to be around 1,900 words. And then a company called Backlinko, they analyze 11.8 million Google search results and they found that 1,447 words was the sweet spot. So if we take an average of those three, you're looking at 1,449 words per page. Well, let's just call it 1,500 to be safe, is the sweet spot you really need to be aiming for when writing content. Now, again, it's important that it is deep, relevant content, not just stuffed with keywords, but we're using those relatable keywords from that software that we mentioned before, but you have to have enough, right? And really when you're writing deep, relevant content, you kind of have to use a few words to explain your concept. So how do I know how many words that I have on my website right now? Well, of course, I've got a tool for you that you're gonna be able to check that out. So what you need to do is you need to go to wordcounter.net forward slash website dash word dash count, as you can see up here. So on this website, you have the ability to simply just put in your page URL, so whether it's your home page or some of your other subsequent pages and be able to see what your word count is. Super easy to use, it's free, and it'll let you know whether or not you're at that 1500 word per page mark. That's what we're shooting for, and this is a great tool for you to be able to see if you are hitting that mark. So again, images and videos, deep relevant content that has some length to it. Those are our first three. Let's jump into number four and see what number four has up for us. So number four is kind of interesting. I just told you that it needs to be deep and relevant. I just told you that it needs to be long. Now it needs to be 
readable and it has to have what's called a high readability score. You probably even know that there's something called a readability score and that Google actually has one and they do. So what is a readability score? A readability score is, as it sounds, it's a score and there's a few different methods and technologies or we'll call grading systems that exist out to there today. I'm gonna to show you what the gold standard is that basically tell at what grade level uh, something is written. So unfortunately, a lot of businesses get caught up in trying to maybe look smart or look highly qualified. So they write things in a deep, relevant, long way, but they use a lot of big words. Now you're being condescending. See, mm -hmm. you've been warned, all right? Let's move forward amicably. Okay, well, so check I this out. Though. First of all, you're throwing too many big words at me, okay? Now, because I don't understand them, I'm gonna take them as disrespect. And they use a lot of words to maybe try to impress people of their knowledge of the space. I can think of my old financial planner. I used to sit down with this guy and ask him what was going on with my money. And he used to say all these words that made no sense to me. And I thought to myself, on one side, wow, this guy's really smart. He knows this stuff really well. But on the other side, I was like, I have no idea what you just said. So I often left more confused than when I came in as to what was going on. I no longer work with that guy. So how do we do this? How do we make something more readable? First thing, pretty simple, use simpler words. Instead of stuffing it with overcomplicated words that kind of fluff up maybe the knowledge you have around something, use simpler words. To make it more simplistic, just write how you speak. And the reality is that when you see these overly complicated blogs or, or sentences or paragraphs that are stuffed with a lot of fancy words that most people probably pulled out of a thesaurus, the reality is most people don't talk that way, right? So write in a way in which you would speak and that just makes it more readable. Another thing you can do is you can actually just measure it. So you can go to a website. Let's show you that website right now. The website is called www.webfx.com forward slash tools forward slash read dash able, A-B-L-E. So what this does is it actually measures something that's called a flesh Kincaid reading score. And you wanna be looking for a score that's around the 80s, right? Around the 80s shows that you have a high level of readability on your website. And what it'll also do is it'll actually show you what grade level you've written on. Now, I don't think you wanna write for like first graders, right? But you wanna be in kind of that sixth, seventh, eighth grade level when it comes to writing, because that's just a lot easier to read. That's, I think, where really most people talk. So again, use this as a tool. It's not the total rule of thumb, but because there are some industries that have to use complex words when writing their deep relevant content. But generally speaking, if you can have that flesh Kincaid score being around the 80s and have that you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade level on your uh, website, then you're doing pretty good and you have a high level of readability because guess what? Google's looking at this and they're going to push you higher up the ranking based off your readability score. So that said, let's jump into the next secret on what you need to have on your website. The next thing you need is what's called scannable web formatting. So what is that? About 80% of people who visit your website are just going to scan it. So I know we just talked about stuffing it with images and video and deep relevant content and having a lot of words and making it readable, but the reality is most people are going to scan it until they stop at a point where they're, they're more engaged and they look at it in greater depth. And when people scan a website, it's actually, there's, a, there's softwares out there that have shown and proven that they read it in the form of a Z, right? So it's important in the way in which your website is structured that you take that Z formation into consideration when making something that is more scannable. And by scannable, it, uh, another way to, to reference that or to explain that is to, to make it look less overwhelming. One thing that allows users to achieve their task and uh, complete their goal quicker. While we wanna keep somebody on the website for a good period of time, if you make it scannable, if the goal is to get them to take a call to action and things are chopped up and scannable, then it allows people to get to that call to action quicker. They're less intimidated. So it's able to see them in small little chops and then take that call to action and click that button to go ahead and book that appointment with you, for example. Another reason is users make fewer mistakes in this search of content that they're looking for. When you have a message that's embedded in something that's long, like a long paragraph that's not broken up, has no images, has no numbers, uh, has no headings and subheadings, 
um, it's, it's very easy for things to get lost. But when you break it out so it's more scannable, it allows people to be able to make the correct choice quicker and more accurately. Another reason is people understand the navigation and how to use your website. When you, th when you make things more scannable, it allows people to understand where things are in your website versus again, it being confused and jammed into something big and clumpy. When things are broken out, it's very easy to know what you do and how to get to certain parts of your website a lot faster. When we design websites for clients, we, it's often designed in strips. So you have these strips of information on let's say the homepage, for example, and that strip of information may be talking about, let's say for example, about the company, right on the homepage, but it only has a little snippet about the company. And if they click learn more, it brings them to the about us page, which is in greater depth, right? We'd have some more uh, in depth, longer, deep relevant content. And maybe the strip underneath that goes over the portfolio of a client and highlights three properties for let's say a real estate syndication company in the example I'm showing you right now. And if they click on, you know, view all properties, it brings them to another page that, you know, basically displays their entire portfolio. So as I start to scan through that homepage, I'm seeing almost like a table of contents in a book, just little sections that I can click on to be able to get to the deeper section of the website where I can expand on that information. One of the big reasons, and this is one here for Google, is the bounce rate is reduced. If I go to a website, think about it. If you go to a website right now, that as soon as you open it up, it's just nothing but just a text vomit, right? It's just all words, not broken up, not scannable. I start to get anxiety. I start to get worked up and, and I'm scared. Like, oh my gosh, I, I'm not gonna sit here and read all this stuff. I probably doesn't have what I want and I'm gonna leave. That's called bounce rate. So when you make a website more scannable where people can just use that Z formation to go through the website with their eyeballs, it greatly reduces your bounce rate. Another reason that it makes your website appear more credible, right? When it's broken out into smaller bits with those images, those headings and subheadings, which we'll get into in a second, it just, it adds an air of credibility, which keeps people engaged, keeps people on your website longer. And then ultimately the last reason is it boosts your SEO. When you make a website more scannable, all those reasons that I just described really helps people stay on your page, learn what they want, click, take calls to action, and that ultimately increases on page time or reduces bounce rate. And Google likes that, they're gonna shove you up the old search engine result page even higher so that uh, more people can find you. So. Scannability is a huge, huge piece that is often overlooked by a lot of folks, and that's why it's one of these top secrets. So let's dive into a little bit greater depth on how you make your website more scannable. The first thing you do is you prioritize by visual hierarchy. So what do I mean by this? Visual hierarchy is you basically put the most important images and more important words towards the top, and then you make them look visually bigger. An example of this is, if I've got a series of pictures where I'm trying to tell a relevant story and I want that to be uh, the highlight of what I do, I put that more towards the top of the scan or the top of the page. And then when I'm trying to explain that section in words, I make a large heading, which gets to the point of what I'm talking about, then a small subheading, right? Which maybe expands a little bit further if I've caught your attention with the image and the large heading and then it dives into the paragraphs, right? Which is the deep relevant content that we talked about earlier. But from a scannability perspective, you need to have that big heading and that subheading so that it's broken up in a visual hierarchy uh, that doesn't intimidate people. To use the example I mentioned before, if I open up a website and it's just jammed with word vomit, just one giant clump of a paragraph, think about the emails that you get from people or friends or family or even text messages, and it's just this big, long word vomit. You're probably like, yeah, I'm not gonna read that. That seems like a real big investment of my time. Let me go somewhere else where I can scan it and get the gist a lot quicker. Another thing you can do is you can put the core navigation menu in both the header and the footer. Now, most people know to put the core navigation in the header of a website. And when speaking about that Z formation, the first thing that people read is they come across that menu, then they come across the middle of what we call the hero image of your website, which is that first image or video 
with wording and a call to action on it, if designed appropriately, that's in the middle of your page, then they may come across the bottom of the page before they even move the mouse to go to the first strip of a website. So it's very important that that, that menu header is very clear and concise and is displaying the things that you want people to take action on. And then in that middle part of the Z, um, you, is, that's really where you have those calls to action, a big heading, a subheading, and an image behind it or a video behind it that tells me within three to five seconds what it is that I do. So from there, it's super important to have a very similar structure minus the image at the bottom of the website, and that's in your footer. So in that footer is basically your menu all over again because when people get to the bottom of your website, they wanna know where to go. So if you don't give them a place to click, to go somewhere else and have that expanded blown out footer with all types of options and choices, what are they gonna do? They're gonna bounce. Google doesn't like that. Call to action, CTA. I mentioned it earlier in this, uh, in this training, but call to action is literally everything. That's the button that's on your website or the buttons, if done right, that's on your website to, that basically shows you uh, and, and, has, and tells that person what to do, right? book an appointment, buy the t-shirt, make that phone call. That call to action needs to be literally spilled all over your website and almost every single strip of the website. And the reason for this is that's the entire purpose of why you're doing this, is you're continually, as they're scrolling, giving them a reason to take the ultimate call to action. So if you don't have those buttons baked throughout your website from a uh, we'll call it scannability perspective, they don't have an out, right? If I'm scan, 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 and I don't see where I can click and do something, it's not gonna help me with that ultimate goal. And that's a very, very big factor as it relates to your scannability of a website. Next one is, we mentioned it earlier, and that's your readability score needs to be in check. So make sure you've done that Kincaid flesh scale uh, checkup on that website and make sure that your readability score is in check. If it's stuff with big words and um, phrases that most people won't understand, it's going to lower your scannability because as they're scanning and they see a word that they need to pull out Webster's Dictionary to understand, chances are they're going to bounce. The next one is applying numbers in addition to words throughout your website. And in many cases, maybe even applying numbers instead of words. Let me share some statistics on putting in statistics. So the Nielsen Norman Group shared an important finding that eye tracking studies have shown that in the process of scanning web pages, numerals often stop the wanderer's eye and attract fixations. It stops them. Even embedded in a mass of words that would normally be ignored, if you put a number in there, people stop. So having statistics on the website, even statistics that move, as you can see in the example below, that, that, that really stops and catches your eye. And it's a way to impressively showcase your value. So showing that statistics uh, that are in there helps with your readability and also helps with validation of a point you're trying to make uh, in your copy. Short paragraphs, one concept per paragraph and that's it. While that may make a lot of smaller paragraphs, that is a lot more pleasing on an eye. If you have multiple concepts buried inside of one really chunky long paragraph, it's a total snooze fest. People are gonna bounce because they get anxiety and they get stress over oh my gosh, I gotta read all this now? But if I just have to read a small little snippet from a scannability perspective, it really helps people move through, grasp your concepts, and ultimately make that call to action. Bullets, not the kind that come out of a gun, but use bullets on your web page. Those bullets break out concepts into smaller, more digestible bites uh, and really help improve scannability of your website. Another little trick is you can highlight certain text inside of your wording in your paragraph and even make it clickable. So if there's something that is embedded in a paragraph, it's a key concept or a phrase that you really want people to um, take action on or make it stand out, you can highlight it and make it clickable. Make it go to some other part of your website, a blog post or a call to action, but highlight that. So when I'm reading a bunch of black lettering and all of a sudden I see something that's blue, Naturally, I'm gonna maybe slow down and stop my scan in a Z to be able to see what that is. And maybe I'll make that click. And when I start clicking through a website and I go deeper into the pages, Google goes, okay, wait a second. This is some deep, relevant, readable, scannable content. We're gonna push them up the old Google feed. And the last one is basically the first one that we talked about. 
Using those images and video inside your website is going to improve your scannability score. So make sure you're using those. So that is a lot that we just covered, but those are the basics in terms of things that you can do to improve the scannability of your website. Because again, 80% of people who visit your website are only going to be scanning it. So make that a enjoyable process for them and avoid the just overly word vomit as I've referred to several times uh, in this video. Now we're gonna cover our next secret, which is lead magnets. The reality is, that most people who visit your website are going to leave and never come back again. I know that's a scary thought. We talk about all these things that we can do to make a website more engaging, but most people who go to a website, they leave and they don't do anything. Just think about yourself. You're going to pound around the World Wide Web looking for solutions. And the, the hope and the goal is to engage that individual to take that call to action. But what if you haven't done that? But instead, you provided them with something of such tremendous value that they gave you the almighty email address. And from that, now when they leave the website, you can chase them down forever or until they unsubscribe from your mailing list. Believe it or not, email marketing is still one of the most effective ways in which you can market to an individual. So when someone comes to your website and you offer something of tremendous value to get that email address, that process of doing what we call a drip campaign uh, really does help to convert, really does drive them back to your website. And moreover, it starts to continue to establish that no like trust relationship. I know what you're thinking. You know, you signed up for Groupon once, you go inside of there, inside your email, and like you get two emails a day from Groupon that's just blowing you up with stuff that you could care less about. How you live your hey! life. Hey! My God, how can one woman possibly take care of so many emails? Delete some of these! What if I need them later? Oh, like this Groupon for a $15 facial from 2014? 2014? Okay, well I wanted to remember what place did the facial. It's in Dallas, Texas. But you don't delete it. And the reality is one day, you want to take your kids bowling and there happens to be a coupon inside a Groupon for bowling and you click on it. Well, guess what they got you, right? Although you deleted 97% of those emails that came in, you did click on one. And although the statistics don't sound so impressive in terms of click-through rate and uh, CTA rate, um, the reality is that email marketing is still extremely, extremely successful as it relates to growing your business. Okay, so then what is a lead magnet? Well, when someone comes to your website and they see something that they're gonna give you their almighty email address, that lead magnet is something of value that's relevant to what you do, right? So say for example, you have a blog that's on cooking and you're trying to gain an email address, email address list so you could send people your blog so you can drive your blog up and ultimately get paid on it. A lead magnet would be if someone came to your website and they were looking for guacamole recipes. And you had several that were out there, but then boom, up pops on the page, the number one guacamole recipe that your grandmother didn't share with you. Peel the avocado, peel the avocado. Just an example, right? So you're like, oh, wait a second. There's five guacamole recipes on this page, but the one that, I mean, my grandmother makes pretty good guacamole that she didn't share with me, I gotta have that one. What? I must have it. So I'll put in my email address and then boom, instantly I'm given a PDF or taken to a web page where I now have access to that just next level guacamole recipe that hopefully changes your life. Guacamole. Now that's just one example of a lead magnet. Let's go through a couple other ones that exist out there today. One is an ebook. An ebook is pretty simple. It's just a, something that you write that's relevant to what you do and it has information inside of there that uh, is enticing. So very similar to this video, the seven secrets that you must have inside of your website in order to uh, you know, be able to, uh, to take it next level, you know, yours can be the seven secrets or the seven hidden rules or something that basically has a little mystery to it that people otherwise uh, wouldn't know where to get it and they have to get it from you. So that can be done in an ebook. That can be done in a video series, very similar to this, where you just sit in front of the camera and you talk about what you're knowledgeable about. People like video, but some people like to read it as well. A video course. Sometimes doing a course is something that's appealing to people. So if I'm new in the real estate industry 
and I need to learn about all the vocabulary that exists with uh, the syndication of real estate and raising capital for buying multifamily properties, I would probably download this course right here uh, to learn more about all the terminology that those individuals use. That would have value to me and I would give my email address for that. Written guides, resource guides, webinars is another great one. Uh, we have a, we do a lot of webinars for our clients here where they take a video and they put it out there as a live webinar, although it's not live, but it's a great way to provide some value, grab an email address to later remarket to. Templates, depending on what type of work you're in, if you're a copywriter, for example, and you can provide email templates or text templates for free, like here you go, here's some free value. You haven't even paid me a dollar, but I'm gonna give you something right now. All I need is your email address. So then you can remarket to that individual to sell them you know, the beefier stuff that you have to offer. And probably one of the last ones that I can think of off the top of my head is like an active group. So if you can provide value or like, hey, you can join my exclusive Facebook group where I'm gonna give you tips and tricks on how to better market your business, just pop me your email address and we'll invite you right away. Okay, so if you watch some of my content or maybe you've, um, you've connected with me in some level and you feel that I'm a good resource to you, hey, you know what, you may give me your email address so that you can then join uh, our Facebook group and, you know, and, and potentially benefit from it. So private groups is another great thing as well that we see a lot of people use for lead magnets. All in all, lead magnets are a critical part and a must have on every single website. I can't stress that enough because again, most people that come to your website, although you followed all those rules that we've descri described so far, they're gonna leave. Bye, Felicia. So we have to find a way to be able to capture their email address via a lead magnet so we can continue to nurture them. We have plenty of other education where we talk about how to create a lead magnet, but hopefully you understand the importance and why you need to have one. So with that said, let's go into number seven, which is speed. You have to have a fast, I mean blazing fast website or people are going to leave. Us human beings, we're, we're impatient, right? We're impulsive, we move quickly. And especially in today's digital world, people are having images and video and words flashing from their eyes so fast that there's a certain pace and a cadence that continues to seem to get heightened. If you can't play in that, at that speed, you can't work at that speed of your website, people that are in that mode, scanning through the internet mindlessly on their phone or on their computers where they're making those impulsive decisions, you're gonna lose. If you ain't first, you're last. You know? So if your website isn't fast, they're gonna leave. Unfortunately, we can't change human nature. We have to cater to it. And by catering to it, you need to make sure that you have a fast website. So how fast does it need to be? Well, in 2021, John Mueller, a senior webmaster and trend analyst at Google, says that a website needs to load in less than two to three seconds or ideally faster. So that's pretty fast. Let's face it, if someone goes to your website and they click on it and they have to wait for it to load, they're gonna leave. We've all been there. We've all clicked on something because we impulsively saw it on Facebook. We clicked on that external link that went to a website and it was too slow. Now, could it be your cell phone? Could it be a Wi-Fi connection? Absolutely, those are out of your control and unfortunately we lose those battles sometimes. But if your website is slow, which you do have control over, you'll lose that individual. So how do you find out if your website is fast? Well, you can run a test and here are a couple places that you can do it. You can go to tools.pingdom, that's P-I-N-G-D-O-M.com and you can run a free test which will basically show how fast your web page loaded, and it does it in a variety of different locations across the world. The next one you can use is called gtmetrics.com. Very similar service, free of charge, and it gives you the ability to be able to go out there and find out how fast your website is. And then you can take the necessary steps in order to correct it. And another way in which you can find out whether or not your website is fast, Look at things like readability score, look at things at how your search engine optimization is, look at things such as uh, how you stack against your competitors. 
is you can run a free website audit. In order to do that, you can visit our website, www.adaptmediaagency.com, completely free of charge, no obligation, and we'll run you a very thorough 20 page analysis, free of charge, of how your website stack ranks. And it's, it's basically like getting blood work for your website, right? You go to the doctor, you get blood work, kind of tells you your baseline, where you are, where your blood levels are, and areas of improvement, right? If my cholesterol is a little too high, maybe I need to cut down on my red meat. Same thing with this report. This will give you for your website, consider it the digital blood work for your business to know where you stand today so that you can take the necessary action on improving it. So we highly recommend you take this free website audit uh, and allow us to show you the results. So with that said, thank you so much for taking the time today to listen to the seven secrets to really developing an amazing website, one that's gonna be high performing, high producing, highly engaging, and get Google to like you so that you will show up in search engines at a more consistent basis. Uh -huh.